So let's talk about filter design a little bit and some of the uh, basic terms and approaches to filter design. We would really like to have ideal filters all the time. If we wanted a low-pass filter, it would be beautiful if it was had a gain of 1 in the pass band and a gain of 0 in the stop band, and the transition between those two bands uh, was uh, instantaneous. In practice, of course, we can't have this, and so we're going to now define a uh, pass band as a region where we have a gain approximately equal to 1, or whatever our pass band gain uh, is that we decide. And the stop band for the gain is approximately equal to zero. And we will let the gain in the pass band vary a certain amount. And we'll let the gain in the stop band vary a little a certain amount. And between the pass band and the stop band we'll have a transition band. The transition band um, will be unspecified in most filter design techniques. And that's fine because if we've done a good job, then in order to reduce the degrees of freedom, the best that the filter can possibly do is to beeline it from the pass band to the stop band. And uh, you tend to get something like the red filter that I've drawn right here. So there are different types of filters, filters with uh, that have ripple in the pass band but not in the stop band and vice versa or in neither or in both but first it should be noted that iir filters um, begin with an analog prototype we'll talk more about those in a few lectures but for now we'll just Put this down. So the basic types of analog filters are the Chebyshev filter. The Chebyshev filter has no ripple in the stop band or the pass band. I say the Chebyshev. I meant the Butterworth if I said Chebyshev. So the Butterworth filter has no ripple. The Chebyshev type 2 filter has ripple in the stop band but not in the uh, pass band. The Chebyshev type 1 filter has ripple in the pass band but not in the stop band. And the elliptic filter has ripple in the pass band and in the stop band. So designing filters in general is an optimization process. And what you gain in one area, you tend to give up in another. And ripples are one of those big trade-offs. So the Butterworth filter ends up with no ripples, but as a result, the transition band tends to be very wide. It, it takes a, you don't have a very steep transition band. The Chebyshev filters that have ripple in either the stop or the pass band, um, in essence, they give up the degrees of freedom that uh, are used for creating a flat filter, or rather one without ripples, and use that then, uh, use those degrees of freedom to improve the transition band, or in particular the transition bandwidth. The elliptic filter says, well, we can give up flatness in the pass band and in the stop band and in result, as a result, it has a very narrow or steep transition band. Now, even if something, a filter has no ripple in say, like the Butterworth filter has no ripple in the pass band or in the stop band, it doesn't mean that the filter there is uniformly flat with a gain of one or something like that. Uh, the filter there will actually have a response that looks kind of like this. If our target response is 1, a Butterworth filter is going to have a response like that. So steadily decreasing from the maximum deviation to the minimum deviation as it leaves 
in the pass band of the uh, filter. Uh, the Butterworth filter and uh, the Chebyshev Type 1 filter in the stop band, they just barely nick the corner that they're allowed to, the maximum uh, deviation they're allowed in the stop band as they come out of the transition band and then they uh, continue to decrease in amplitude towards zero or on a log scale towards minus infinity. So here's, here are some comparisons uh, of low-pass filters. These low-pass filters have approximately the same kind of characteristics. For a Butterworth filter, uh, we would have a 14th order filter. So this 14th order uh, Butterworth filter means that n in our uh, difference equation is 14, whereas a Chebyshev type filter uh, can reach the same characteristics using only an eighth order filter. That's a huge gain. And the elliptic filter can do it with only six. So the total multiplications required for the elliptic are minimized. The total adds and the total storage are all minimized. However, uh, we also have down here two other filters that I didn't discuss above, and these are um, FIR filters. The first one is the Kaiser filter. Um, it uses a particular technique for filter design based on uh, a window function uh, designed by someone with the last name Kaiser. And the PMC stands for Parks McClellan. Uh, Tom Parks was a professor at Rice, and Jim McClellan is a professor here at Georgia Tech. So with those, uh, FIR filters require a much higher order to have similar response. So the Kaiser requires a 37th order filter, that's huge, and Parks McClellan is still double almost the Butterworth filter, uh, which was the worst of the uh, IR filters in terms of performance. It requires, uh, Parks McClellan requires 28 multiplies, but as you can see that's crossed out and made 14. And let me show you why and what's going on there. So in practice, these FIR filters are going to be symmetric. Actually, let's put it over here. So we would have maybe something for a low-pass filter that had a response That looked like that, giving us our low pass filter. Well, these two are going to have the same value, and so are those, and so are those, and so on. So, since each of those delayed samples is going to be multiplied by the same gain, why don't we do the addition first and the multiply only once? And so what that looks like here is a strange filter structure where we have delays the input is shown here so the minus one delays like so. Now let's see. This would be E and that would be F. So F is going to be the value that's not delayed at all and the one that's delayed the most. So we'll bring those two values together, sum them up, Now we multiply by f. 
come out here this value is going to be multiplied by e and summed with the product with f and you get the pattern but I'm having so much fun drawing let's just keep going This would be summed into there and multiplied by d and so forth. So now, instead of multiplying the term at zero delay and the term at the maximum delay by f, we just multiply once following the addition. And as a result, we cut the number of multiplies in half. And this works for any linear phase design. So one other thing that's on this plot that's kind of interesting is the TMS-320 cycles. So this is based on a Texas Instruments DSP chip that's optimized for doing filtering. And one of the things we haven't discussed is how exactly would you, we, we know the steps, we know the multiplies, we know the adds, but how would you actually program this up? Turns out that if you have something that's very simple in its uh, data access, it's easier to make it much more efficient. So in this case, the uh, DSP chip can do the FIR filter much more efficiently than it can do even the elliptic filter. So while IIR filters tend to have kind of steeper responses, there are reasons uh, and advantages that come out with FIR filters as well. Okay, so now that we've looked at that, let's take a brief moment and go over and look at some filter design in MATLAB. So MATLAB has a, if you have the uh, signal processing toolbox, it has a function called filter designer. And this is what it looks like. So here we see the passband as we had in our diagram and the stop band. A stop is the stop band attenuation and A pass is the pass band ripple allowed. And then the space between the stop band and the pass band are the transition region. So we're once again looking at a low pass filter as we did before. If we went to high pass it would look the same. It would just flip around and if we did went to band pass we would have now two transition regions and two stop regions. So this allows us to choose different IIR filter methods. We have Butterworth, Chebyshev, Type 1 and Type 2, Elliptic, all that we've seen. We also have a few others, Constrained, Least Peak Norm, Maximally Flat, and so on. So we'll take a look at some of these. Let's start with Butterworth. We can also look at um, FIR. The equal ripple design is the parks mcclellan algorithm. And window design is what we would use to get the Kaiser method that we saw before. But we're going to stick with our IAR filter method. You can specify this in terms of relating it back to the original frequency by giving it your sample frequency and then within the analog or continuous domain, give it the associated frequencies. But we're just going to say our sample frequency is 2. Therefore, our highest frequency can be 1. So our pass band will put it at 0.3. And our stop band will put it at 0.5. Then uh, we're given the stop band ripple and the or pass band ripple and the stop band attenuation and we can tell it that we want minimum order and click design it thinks for a moment quite a long moment there we are so remember we're looking at this on a log scale so up until about uh, 300 millihertz or 0.3 we've got what looks like a flat response. We're going to zoom in on it in just a moment and see that it's not perfectly flat. 
After that, it continually drops off until it reaches minus 80 here at the stop band and keeps going down from there. That's how a, a Butterworth filter operates. We can also plot, uh, that's the magnitude response. We can plot the phase response in radians, plot them on top of each other. And you can see that uh, the phase is almost linear in the pass band, but as it gets near the transition band, uh, it starts to steepen off and then settles down. So one of the things that's really interesting, I think, is looking at the poles and zeros. Remember how we went over in uh, the notes what happens if you have repeated zeros in the same spot? The impact of repeated zeros in the same spot is that the derivatives of the magnitude response at that point go to zero. So this would have 14. It, not only would the response go to zero, but the uh, magnitude response, the derivatives, the first 14 derivatives would also be zero. That makes it really flat in that area. Here we have poles. We've also discussed how poles cause ripple. Well, if they're spaced just perfectly, we can take care of that. You can imagine then if we quantize this and it causes those to move a little bit at all, we're going to start getting ripple. But right now they're perfectly placed. Okay. As promised, we said we would zoom in, so let's do that and see what it looks like in this little area here. You see, it actually looks pretty flat. Right around 300, it breaks and goes out. We'll zoom in a little bit more. So. The diagram I showed of it uh, gradually moving down, it still holds. But as you can see, uh, the this is beautifully flat, and so I exaggerated the effect. Okay, so restore view. There we go. Now over here where it says current filter information, it says direct form 2, second order sections. And we can actually change what that looks like. Um, just have to remember exactly where. There, convert to a single section. The response changed just a little. At least it looks like it changed a little. What we actually see is that it changed a lot. The poles, which weren't really tightly clustered, moderately tightly clustered, didn't move too much. But the zeros, which were very tightly clustered, now scattered, and they now form this ring. We're lucky that those are zeros and not poles, because if they were zeros, they would have just jumped outside the unit circle, and we would have been in trouble. Um, so we can convert back to second order sections. It's not updating. Okay, we'll worry about that in a minute because now we're going to come and load up the filter quantization panel. This is showing over on the left with this uh, graph with a stair step on it. And when we do filter quantization, we will see that the. Oh, I see what it is. We need to go back and redesign to get back to the filter the way it was. It starts with double precision floating point. If we go to fixed point, we will ask for some settings in just a moment. And we say we want 16-bit integers and that it can use fractional values. The way it uses fractional values is, uh, for example, by having the uh, binary radix point at an arbitrary point for each uh, coefficient value. So 
So there we go. Now we can go back to design the filter. We have second order sections. And the way to understand what you're seeing here is that the quantized poles are right on top of the reference poles. And the quantized zeros are right on top of the reference zeros. So now what happens if we uh, in second order sections we want to convert to a single section this is what happens that looks pretty nasty so what used to be a nearly perfect filter even though we were dealing with finite arithmetic has now become a disaster our new poles are these pluses Whereas they used to be in this nice crescent, they now form a football shape. The old zeros used to be right there at the origin. When we converted it to uh, a single structure, even with double precision arithmetic, it caused all the poles that were sitting there right at um, negative one or an angle of pi to go into this circle and then once we quantized it they scattered all over the place so we can look at now our frequency response and we can see that fortunately it's still doing okay but not great when I say not great I mean okay pretty badly we're now about 12 dB off on our passband near the cutoff frequency. Okay, so that was it for a uh, Butterworth filter. Let's go look at a few other filters. First, let's put this back to double precision and work up to things gradually. We're now going to go to a Chebyshev Type 1 filter and all the specifications will keep the same as before. Uh, we had, just for reference, we had a 15th order filter before, and now you can see over here on the left, upper left, we now have a direct form 2, second order sections, ninth order, uh, has five sections to do that. And now you can see that it, uh, two things, one, and it may be hard till I zoom in, we can see that we actually have some ripple in the passband. And as a second thing, we can see that <clears throat> the drop-off seems a little bit more abrupt coming out of the pass band and heading towards the stop band. Now it's going to hit the same transition region we told it to before, uh, but we can do it now with a lower order filter. Go to Chebyshev Type 2, Design Filter. And this is going to be, once again, a low-pass filter like it was before, but this time we have a nice flat response in the pass band like we did with the Butterworth filter. But the stop band has ripples in it. It keeps coming up back to our minimum uh, attenuation of minus 80 dB, and it bounces around there. And finally, when we go to our elliptic filter, We went from a ninth order down to a sixth order filter. And we have the uh, ripples in both pass and stop band. Okay, so let's look at what's gone on here. We have a slightly different arrangement of our uh, poles. These ones are in a crescent, but they're um, oriented the other direction. And the zeros are now spaced evenly around the unit circle. It's the zeros on the unit circle that give us the, re the uh, um, ripples in the passband. Now if we were to come back with this filter and quantize it, <coughs> we see that, wonderfully, everything seems to work really well. 
If on the other hand we convert to a single order section, and wait for a moment, direct form two. This is actually doing pretty well. So why is it? Uh, why did the Butterworth have so much problem? and this one had less. Well, remember there are two things that contribute to problems with filters. One is the uh, number of poles and zeros, the number of roots or the order, and the other is how uh, densely they're packed. Because the order went down, this tends to work out pretty well. If we come back to our filter design, which we are, we make it have uh, steeper requirements. Let's say let's make the transition band smaller. We went from 0.5 to 0.4, so we cut the transition band in half. And now we design the filter to be to reach these requirements. We now have to have more poles and zeros, but we're still pretty good. Let's keep marching down. Cut the transition band in half yet again. And now they're starting to move slightly, but not too bad. The order has gone up to nine. Now we've got the order up to 13 second order sections. Still pretty good. When we go back now and convert this to a single section, the whole thing explodes. We have poles outside the unit circle, poles inside the unit circle. They've just moved all over the place. Even some of the zeros have moved. So at this point, we can plot the magnitude response, but it's an unstable filter. And so the magnitude response, even though we can actually evaluate what the frequency response is, uh, it's meaningless because the filter itself is not stable. So there's a Play around with this a little bit. Uh, one of the homework assignments will have you do that, and you can get some uh, intuition and feel for how things work. I will add just one last story that uh, goes along with this. Many, many years ago, I was getting my master's degree, uh, in which I designed a hearing aid. And we needed to have, it was a digital hearing aid, one of the early digital hearing aids, and so we needed to have these digital filters. Well, I wanted them to be as sharp as possible, so I looked into different filter types. It had to be very, very efficient. So I chose elliptic, because elliptic had these really nice, beautiful, sharp cutoffs, at least when it's uh, not quantized this way. So uh, I designed them put them in MATLAB, and look at that. That looks beautiful, sharp cutoff, exactly what I wanted. But we had two problems. One, the phase response went crazy near that cutoff. It just changed dramatically. So that was one problem. Found out some ways to deal with that a little bit. The other problem was that... Uh, when I went from the double precision uh, arithmetic in MATLAB to the single precision float on the DSP chip, that was enough to throw the poles outside the unit circle and cause the whole filter to go unstable. So even with floating point arithmetic, it was so sensitive that it uh, ended up not working. Of course, we found something else, but uh, that was a learning experience. All right. I'll Till next time.